Good day. The last couple of hours since the debacle of the United Nations Security Council session has seen a return to quiet diplomacy. We've had the conversations between Vladimir Putin and President Macron of France and Prime Minister Draghi of Italy that um, I discussed in my previous programme. We've also had a telephone conversation between US Secretary of State Antony Blinken and Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov with an agreement for more discussions. We've had confirmation from Putin that a summit meeting between himself and uh, Macron is in the works. And we've had an important summit meeting between Putin and President and Prime Minister Orban of Hungary, a political leader who, it must be said, despite the many criticisms he comes under in the West, has certainly managed if he, to put Hungary on the diplomatic map and who punches far above his weight. Well, there's been an important summit meeting between Orban and Putin and also a very important and very interesting and very revealing press conference. But before I come to discuss all these issues, I have to say something which is now about the sanctions question, because it is becoming increasingly clear that as reality dawns, sanctions, the sanctions that we've been talk hearing about so much about, the sanctions from hell, the unprecedented sanctions, the sanctions which would have massive consequences for the Russian economy. These sanctions are steadily diminishing in impact as every um, analyst, anal analytical uh, um, analyst um, employed by Western governments comes and looks at the consequences of these sanctions for the world economy. So let's just start. It's now, I think, almost universally acknowledged and accepted that disconnecting Russia from SWIFT would be an extremely bad idea. There's been two long articles in the Financial Times which make the point that I've made repeatedly in many programmes that SWIFT, the effect of SWIFT on Russian um, transactions, the Russian bank's ability to carry out transactions is overstated. Russia, of course, has its own messaging, interbank messaging system, its own uh, internal messaging system, which it is now linking up with those of China and Iran, especially, and perhaps most pertinently, those of China. And in terms of um, cross-border trade, trade with the European Union and the rest, the Russians would be able to continue that trade using those same fallback mechanisms, falling back on those same traditional mechanisms, promissory notes, fax, telexes, email exchanges, whatever that existed before the SWIFT messaging system was brought into being. Um, in fact, there's been more reports now that it's not just Germany that's having doubts about the whole idea of opting out, of, of disconnecting Russia from SWIFT. I was contacted by a, uh, a, a third party um, um, recently, a well-informed third party, who told me that he had heard from reliable sources that the Federal Reserve Board has advised the United States government that um, disconnecting SWIFT would be an extremely bad idea. It would removing a country of such pivotal importance to world trade, to trade in energy and trade in food and trade in other commodities from the SWIFT interbank payment system would be a major step towards that system's collapse and possibly towards a reliance internationally on a Chinese system, which would then become the most viable alternative. Now, I can't confirm that. I've not obviously had direct access to these sources, and I certainly don't have information about what goes on within the 
Federal Reserve Board or the kind of advice it is giving to the United States government. But I strongly suspect that this is correct, that this is exactly the kind of advice the US government is receiving and it makes sense to me. So the idea of disconnecting Russia from SWIFT has been taken apparently off the agenda. It's now recognised that this isn't a realistic option. So we're down once more to the sanctions, the same sanctions that were imposed in 2014. I think this is something that people have not really understood. But if you go back to 2014, and as I've discussed in several, on several instances, the sanctions that were imposed in 2014 took three forms. Firstly, there were sanctions against Russian banks, the big Russian state banks. Then there were the sanctions against the Russian energy industry, the attempts to restrict exports of high technology products in the expectation that this would cause Russian oil and gas production to fall, suffocating the Russian government of funds, even as the financial sanctions on the Russian banks choked off the prospect of Russia receiving funding from abroad. And then there were the high technology sanctions, the so-called dual use sanctions, which were supposed to undermine the development of Russia's industrial economy. These were dual use sanctions, which were supposed to apply to sanctions that uh, are on products, high tech technology products that could in theory be used in Russia's defense sector, but which of course in practice could be extended to almost anything and in many cases have been extended to cover almost anything. Well, and alongside these sanctions, which were announced by the Western powers, we've had multiple sanctions against people who are said to be in President Putin's inner circle. Whether they really are or not is another matter, but there have been lots of personal sanctions against all sorts of people um, of that kind. And then there were the sanctions which Ukraine itself imposed. Sanctions which, as I said, have not been much talked about, but which were in fact highly consequential because Ukraine played a vital part in the Soviet industrial economy and Russia continued in consequence to import lots of important equipment from Ukraine, equipment like uh, turbines, like um, sh uh, engines for its uh, warships, like um, aircraft engines, all sorts of important products, which were also cut off. And those are the sanctions that were imposed in 2014. And by universal acknowledgement, they have failed. The Russian economy has successfully adapted to all of these sanctions. Well, what we're now hearing is a repetition, essentially, of the same sanctions. So this time there's going to be more sanctions on the banks, the same banks that have already been sanctioned because they were sanctioned in 2014. This is something, by the way, that I've noticed that Western commentary about these financial sanctions scarcely acknowledges. There is hardly any recognition that these big Russian banks that are going to be targeted with these sanctions are in fact already sanctioned. They are restricted in borrowing on world financial markets, at least in dollars and euros, to 30-day loans which in practice makes it all but impossible for them to operate on a significant scale in international money markets. And a couple of years ago, the Western powers were astonished to discover that the sanctions that they'd imposed in 2014 allowed, still allowed Russia to float sovereign debt issues on the international money markets you hear lots of talk about the fact that the Russians are now going to be barred from accessing international money markets for their sovereign debt. Well, in 2014, the Western powers thought that they had already done that. And they've tried to close that loophole since then, 
But the only result has been that the Russians who have been developing their financial sector are now floating sovereign debt uh, loans, government loans, OFZs as they're called, on their own financial markets, something that just didn't happen to any significant extent back in 2014 and before. So these financial sanctions already look somewhat less uh, uh, novel than some people make make it out that they are that make it out that they are they are in fact an attempt again to go back to what was tried in 2014 but to make it work this time and the idea appears to be this time to stop russian banks from converting dollars into rubles the problem is that that still leaves open of how the Europeans are going to pay for their gas. Historically, trade in energy products has been conducted in dollars. Recently, the Russians have been accepting euros in substitution for dollars. And as I understand it, most of Russia's natural gas trade with, Euro, with Europe is now conducted in euros. If that remains the case after these sanctions are imposed, that the sanctions will be ineffective. They won't essentially change anything. If euros are included so that Russian banks are, the Russian, big Russian banks, are not able to convert euros into rubles, then of course that begs the question of how are the Europeans going to pay the Russians for their gas? Well, there's been some incredibly bizarre ideas floating around. I saw somewhere someone suggests that an escrow account be opened somewhere in which the Europeans pay money in pay money into that account until the day finally comes when the sanctions are lifted and then the Russians are paid from that account for all the gas they've been supplied in the meantime. That is a fantastic, that is a grotesque idea. It implies that the Russians will go on providing gas to the Europeans for free until some day comes when the Europeans decide that they can actually pay them out of this escrow account. That is a ludicrous idea. And in practice, some other payment mechanism would have to be found. One possibility, which I've also seen, is that the Europeans may create some kind of payment mechanism whereby funds are paid, euros are paid to uh, a bank, say in Shanghai. The China, that bank, that bank in Shanghai, then converts those euros into Chinese RMB and then the RMB, the Chinese currency, is then paid to the Russians. Well, that not only seems to me ludicrously overcomplicated, but again, it undermines the position of the euro, as well as the dollar, in international financial transactions. So, again, it doesn't seem to me to be a viable uh, solution, and I can't help but think that some way would ultimately be found to continue to pay the Russians in euros. At which point, the whole exercise, the whole financial sanctions become meaningless or essentially meaningless. Then there's been talk about doing various things to um, find alternatives for Russian gas to Europe. Russian oil, presumably, in case those are sanctioned too, or unless, it, or in case the Russians cut these off. Well, again, what's now become increasingly clear is that this massive hunt that's taken place around the world to find alternative supplies for Russian gas in places like Qatar, Algeria, Azerbaijan, Turkmenistan, the United States itself, that it's all proved absolutely fruitless. Instead, we've had lots of talk about diverting liquefied natural gas to Europe in the event of a Russian energy cutoff to Europe. 
But of course, that will firstly not replace all the Russian gas that is lost. But secondly, and this is a point which again I've not seen acknowledged in any Western media outlet, doing that simply diverts gas from other customers. It means that because there is only a limited ability apparently to inc increase gas supply, at least in the short term. There's been talk of a surge, but surges cannot be sustained for very long. So transferring gas from other customers in Asia, in Africa, wherever energy supplies um, is going to deprive those Asian customers of gas in order to supply Europe. And it won't succeed in supplying Europe, but it will deprive Asian customers of gas. Now, one of the most interesting things about that UN Security Council session, which I spoke about yesterday, was the way in which, as I discussed in my previous programme, all the non-Western states on the Security Council, countries like India, Brazil, Mexico, Kenya, Gabon, Ghana, the UAE, all of them seemed to tell the Western powers, calm down, negotiate, find a solution. We're not with you on this. And one can't help but think that one of the reasons why all of these countries are becoming so concerned and are making these points is because they're getting spooked by all these stories about the Americans diverting gas from other customers to Europe. That will result in a worldwide explosion of energy prices and, uh, and as well as possible energy shortages in Asia and in all sorts of other places. One particular um, ambassador at the UN Council session, I think he was the ambassador from Kenya, if memory serves me rightly, actually spoke about the danger of a spillover of a crisis in Europe affecting the situation in Africa. And of course, it's easy to understand the concern because if energy prices worldwide rise, yes, that will create problems, severe problems in Europe, severe problems in the United States. But for fragile economies in the global south and societies in the global south, an energy price explosion would be a calamity. It would result in an extraordinary crisis which their economies might not be able to absorb and which put their political systems under extreme stress. So all of these negotiations, all this talk with energy companies, with countries like Qatar, which, have apparently, which, which has apparently said that it cannot find additional gas to divert to Europe anyway. But all that that is doing is sending tremors around the world and making people around the world worry increasingly about what the United States is up to and urge the United States and the Western powers to begin negotiations with the Russians. So that idea of attempting to restrict the Russian energy sector, that apparently has also been dropped. And interestingly, it's also we also now see that this idea of stopping sales of iPhones, of that kind of consumer technology, has also been stopped. So Russians will continue to be able to buy their iPhones and their, um, and their Macs <laughs> and all of those things, even after these sanctions were imposed. What is, we're now hearing is going to be entirely the export controls are going to be entirely on high-tech products, the kind of products that will supposedly um, affect the Russian industrialization program. But once again, this is exactly what was attempted back in 2014. We've seen all the same ideas in 2014 being revived now. In 2014, it was going to be dual-use technologies, but it was all the same kind of technologies. And from a Russian point of view, they probably feel that they've already done all the heavy lifting. They've now developed 
uh, they've now replaced or, or, or have or are in the process or an advanced process of replacing all the um, types of equipment and industrial products that they used to import from Ukraine. They now have, as I said, microchip production underway in Russia in significant volumes, though we don't have much information about this. They're developing large aircraft engines, the full range of aircraft engines. Um, they've made major advances in developing materials. They've achieved all of that ever since 2014. And they have, in fact, um, in my opinion, already to a great extent negated the effect of these sanctions and, of course, any products that they still need and don't make, they can import from their friends in China. So we're seeing a shrinking of the sanctions essentially back to what was attempted in 2014. It didn't work then. There's no reason to think it would work now. And of course, all these sanctions on individuals, on Russian oligarchs, on uh, people in Putin's inner circle. Well, that's also been done. Nearly all of these people, all of these people, so far as I can judge, have been sanctioned already. Apparently, the idea of sanctioning Putin himself and Lavrov has now been dropped. Apparently, it's recognised that if you sanction Putin, you can't really negotiate with him. So you can't really sanction him. So that idea has also been dropped. So we're going to be engaging in a new round of sanctioning all the same people who have already been sanctioned. So the sanctions weapon is already starting to look less impressive than it had previously. I noticed, for example, that people, Russians, who had previously been nervous about sanctions, like Ivan Timofeyev, the, one of the officials in the uh, Valdai conference, what is Russian think tank, who have been talking about sanctions uh, being devastating for Russia. Even he is becoming increasingly confident, and in his latest pieces, he acknowledges that Russia can withstand this sanctions pressure, even if it is imposed upon it. And in the meantime, the sanctions are causing growing concern around the world, as reflected in that UN Security Council debate. So as the sanctions shrink, both in effectiveness and perception, we now see negotiations taking place. Now, the most interesting um, uh, comment commentaries have been made by um, by um, of all people, uh, uh, um, as usual, by um, Sergei Lavrov, the Russian foreign minister. And we have had a very interesting commentary from him in which he has pointed out that whilst the Americans are, on the face of it, absolutely categorically refusing to discuss the issue of NATO's eastward expansion, um, at the same time, they are gradually um, um, starting to shift their position and they're making significant concessions on other proposals that the Russians have made in the past. And it's, um, and it's quite interesting to read or to, to look at what he says. And um, um, he, he then goes on to say um, that the Americans are now starting to talk about intermediate nuclear treaties. They're starting to, to talk about other things like this in, with a degree of rationality. And this is what he said. Um, in many ways, they are providing kernels of rationality on secondary issues, such as intermediate and short-range short range missiles, which were quite important for us at some point. When the Americans destroyed the INF Treaty, we urged them to listen to reason. President Putin sent a message to all OSCE member states suggesting that they join our unilateral moratorium when agreeing on verification measures. It was ignored. Now it has become part of their proposals. Similarly, our initiatives that were introduced by the general staff 
of the Russian Federation to conduct military exercises further away from the borders on both sides to agree on a critical safe distance between approaching air combat aircraft and ships, as well as a number of other confidence building, deconflicting and de-escalation measures was ignored. All of that has been rejected during the past two to three years. Now they propose discussing this. That is, the constructive approach in these proposals has in fact been borrowed from Russia's recent initiatives. I think that now, as we say in Russia, we are getting somewhere. To reiterate, most importantly, we should figure out the conceptual pillars that underlie European security. So what Lavrov is saying is that up to now, the NATO powers, the United States, has been refusing to negotiate with the Russians on a host of issues. Now, confronted with this situation, this self-created crisis, with these big Russian demands about an end to NATO's eastward expansion, the Americans and NATO are suddenly talking about willingness to discuss Russian proposals. There's even a report in, I believe, El Pais, the Spanish newspaper, I haven't read it, but one which uh, uh, El Pais has apparently had a look at the NATO and US replies to the Russian documents. They've actually had an opportunity to see them. They've been leaked to them, in other words, though, as I understand, they haven't yet published them. El Pais now says that the United States has even agreed to allow the Russians to carry out inspections of the anti-ballistic missile um, um, bases that are being established in Eastern Europe, provided the Russians reciprocate with similar monitoring, American monitoring in Russia. That is a proposal which I am sure the Russians will not agree to, but which does again amount to a significant move by the United States. What, uh, only recently, the United States was refusing to even contemplate um, Russian inspections of these sites, insisting that these sites did not concern Russia. They were intended, supposedly, to counter the missile threat from Iran. But of course, we come back to what Lavrov said, that in order to move on with these things, and he is extremely clear, he, he actually says in it that these are these were issues, these issues about intermediate and short-range missiles, about um, exercises, those sort of things, were quite important for us at some point. In other words, they're not so important any longer. He's saying quite clearly that this has to be, these discussions now must take place once the conceptual pillars that underlie European security are agreed. In other words, once there's been an overarching decision about the various issues that the Russians have been bringing up, issues like the eastward expansion of NATO and those sort of things. So we can see that the Russians sense that they're actually making ground, that the Americans have been forced to the table, that the Americans are having to come up with proposals, even though they are proposals which do not come close to meeting the kind of overarching demands that the Russians are making now. And that may mean that, of course, encourages the, the Russians to take a very strong step position and to insist that the negotiations come back to their original issue of the security guarantees. And there's been a telephone conversation between Lavrov and Blinken, which suggests that the Americans are perhaps becoming more forthcoming to discussing these questions that they have been, than they have been up to now. Now, Lavrov has given a long answer. Uh, he's, it's, it's interesting that the Russians have, um, as well as a readout, a very short and 
rather uninformative readout of this conversation. They've now copied the American practice of having a senior official of their government give a briefing about what was said. And this is a good thing. And I would say that the Russians are now being more transparent than the Americans because instead of the hocus pocus about all of these words being said by some mysterious senior administration official, it's now straightforwardly said that this was Lavrov speaking. So we see that Lavrov is now giving briefings, um, on the record briefings, about his conversations with Blinken. And the question, which is again a question that was put to Lavrov, which is not really a question, it's obviously put together by the Foreign Ministry, it reads as follows. Has Moscow responded to the Americans' written materials that were sent following Russia's proposal on security guarantees? What was the gist of your telephone conversation today with Antony Blinken? What contacts are planned for the future in this context? And Lavrov replies, today we heard from the US State Department that they have allegedly received a response from Moscow to the document that the Americans sent in response to our initial proposals on security guarantees in Europe. This is a, ma a misunderstanding. We started studying the US response when we received it about a week ago. It was clear from the start that the Americans prefer to focus on discussing important albeit secondary issues. They asked if it was possible to agree on the non-deployment of offensive weapons on a reciprocal basis, including medium and shorter range missiles that had been covered once by the INF Treaty, which the US destroyed. They mentioned transparency in holding exercises, measures for un avoiding unforeseen incidents between combat aircraft and ships, and other confidence-building measures. As for the key issue that prompted us to send our initiatives to the United States and NATO, their response was negative. I am referring to our demands for honest implementation of the agreements on the indivisibility of security, which we were reached in the OSCE framework in Istanbul in 1999 and in Astana in 2010. These agreements not only envisage the freedom to choose alliances, but also make this freedom dependent on the need to avoid any steps that would enhance security at the expense of the security of others. We saw that the US and NATO response to our key question was extremely negative. They focus only on the freedom to choose alliances and completely ignore the condition that was approved at the highest level, notably that it is unacceptable to encroach on the security of other states in the process. We are also concerned over the position of other NATO countries, for instance France. Its defence minister said not so long ago that they insist on the need to ensure security based on the documents that preceded the adoption of the Istanbul Charter and the Astana Declaration. The minister cited a document of the 1990 OSCE summit in Paris, which did not contain a demand not to do enhance security at the expense of others. In other words, our Western colleagues are trying to consign to oblivion rather than simply ignore a key principle of international law accepted in the Euro-Atlantic space. By the way, on this point, Lavrov is absolutely right. I've seen several commentaries in the Western media and by Western officials which refer to the 1990 uh, Paris Declaration, but which ignore the subsequent Istanbul and Astana declarations, which has significantly modified it. Anyway, to continue. To prevent this from happening, when we received Washington's response to our initial proposals, I described in detail everything we're talking about now in a separate message and sent it to all foreign ministers of the OSCE states and some other countries to familiarise them with our position. Today, I reaffirmed to Blinken that we won't allow this issue to be dragged out. We will insist on honest conversations and explanations of why the West does not want to honour its commitments at all or only select selectively when it benefits them.
Mr. Blinken agreed that it is a subject for another conversation. We will see how it goes. At present, we are completing the inter interdepartmental work on US proposals on other issues. We will report them to our president. So, according to Lavrov, another meeting between Blinken and Lavrov, one which will address again the Russian demand for legally binding security guarantees and in which Lavrov intends to press Blinken on what was agreed in the um, declarations made in, uh, in um, Istanbul and Astana, which the Western powers are either choosing to ignore or, as Lavrov says, consign to oblivion. Well, that was, that was Lavrov. We've also had a, a, a press conference um, in which we, we uh, attended by Putin and, um, and Orban, in which, of course, uh, Putin himself has weighed in. And I'm going to say that some of his words here have been somewhat misconstrued, so I'm going to actually repeat them. He, says the fol he said the following. Now, I'm using here a machine translation of the Russian text, but I think it is fairly accurate. I would like to explain it once again, the logic of our behaviour and our proposals. As you know, we were given promises not to move the infrastructure of the NATO bloc to the east by a single inch. inch. Everyone knows this well. Today we see where NATO is located. Poland, Romania, the Baltic countries. They said one thing, they did another. As our people say, they cheated, they simply deceived. Then the US withdrew from the anti-ballistic treaty. For a long time we tried not to do this. This is one of the fundamental security treaties in the world. Nevertheless, the United States did what they did, they pulled out. And now, Missile defence launchers are located in Romania and are being created in Poland. They will probably soon be if they if they haven't been yet. And there are MK and these are MK41 launchers on which Tomahawk cruise missiles can be installed. That is, they are no longer an anti-missile but strike systems that will cover our territory for thousands of kilometres. Isn't this a threat to us? Now they say the next step is Ukraine. It needs to be accepted into NATO. Listen to what I have to say carefully. Indeed, in the doctrinal documents of Ukraine itself, it is written that they're going to return they're going to return the Crimea, including by military means, not what they say to the public, but what is written in the documents. Imagine that Ukraine is a member of NATO. It is stuffed with weapons. There are modern strike systems, just like Poland and Romania. Whoever gets in the way and starts operations in Crimea... Now, I'm not even talking about Donbass. This is sovereign Russian territory. The question is closed for us in this sense. Imagine that Ukraine is a NATO country and starts these military operations. Should we fight NATO? Has anyone thought about this? Looks like no. Now, about the implementation of the Minsk agreements. On the one hand, we hear statements that Ukraine wants to fulfil them. We are constantly blamed for not complying with the Minsk agreements. At the same time, there are public statements that if Ukraine fulfills these Mil Mil Minsk agreements, it will fall apart. In parenthesis, that is a reference to a statement by, made by the head of Ukraine's National Defence and Security Council, um, in which he said that if the Minsk agreements were implemented in full, Ukraine would disintegrate. I that was an extraordinarily unwise statement to make at this time, and it suggests that Ukraine is either being placed under pressure, presumably by the Germans or the Fr and the French, conceivably even by the Americans, to uh, fulfil the Minsk agreement, or anticipates that it will soon find itself under that sort of pressure. But anyway, Putin has honed in on this and he points out that it is the Ukrainians, this is an admission, that it is the Ukrainians who are not implementing the Minsk agreement.
And then he goes on to say, no one has thought that if this cre that this creates threats for Russia, who creates similar threats for it for itself? These are all issues that require very careful consideration and consideration of each other's in interests. We are told, yes, each country has the right to choose its own security system. We agree with this, but it seems to me that the same United States is not so much concerned about the security of Ukraine, though they may be thinking about it somewhere in the background, but their main task is to curb Russia's development. That's the problem in this sense. Ukraine itself is just a tool to achieve this goal. This can be done in different ways, by drawing us into some kind of armed conflict and forcing, amongst other things, their allies to impose against us the very tough sanctions that the United States is talking about. Or draw Ukraine into NATO, set up strikes weapon systems there and stimulate some Bandera people that's to say ultra-right people, to resolve the issue of Donbass or Crimea by force of arms. And that still draws us into an armed conflict. It take, if we take a deep, serious look at all these numerous questions, it becomes clear that in order to avoid such a negative development of the situation, and we want to avoid it, we need to really take into account the interests of all countries, including Russia, and find solutions to this problem. Why did we sign treaties, corresponding agreements in Istanbul and Astana, where it is written that no country can ensure its security at the expense of the security of others? Here we are saying that the admission of Ukraine to NATO undermines our security, and we ask the West to pay attention to, the, to, it, to, it, to this. They talk about an open door policy. Where did this come from? NATO has an open door policy, they say. Where is it registered? Nowhere. In Article 10 of the Treaty of 1949, if my memory serves me, on the creation of NATO, it is written that the alliance in agreement with all participants and members of NATO can accept other European countries into its organisation. It can, but it is not obliged. Putin, by the way, is absolutely right about this. Again, in parenthesis, I'm going to read Article 10 of the Washington Treaty, the treaty that supposedly provides for the open door. What it says is the following. The parties may, by unanimous agreement, invite any other European state in a position to further the principles of this treaty and contribute to the security of the North Atlantic area to accede to this treaty. Any state so invited may become a party to the treaty by depositing its instrument of accession with the government of the United States of America. So it is NATO which invites countries to join it, and it has to do so unanimously. There is no reference in Article 10 to any kind of open door. This is a fiction that has been created in the last few years. NATO has every legal means, if it wishes, to say that it is not accepting new members. And then Putin goes on to say, the same United States, the same NATO can say, including to Ukraine, we want to ensure you, your security, we value it, we respect your aspiration, but we cannot accept you because we have other international obligations already taken. What is incomprehensible or even offensive about this for Ukraine? And we need to find a way to ensure the interests and security of all participants in this process, Ukraine, European countries and Russia. But this can only be done with a serious, thoughtful attitude to the documents we have proposed. I hope this business will be continued. Yesterday, we also agreed with the President of France that T2 might come to Moscow in the near future and we will discuss these problems with him as well. I hope that in the end we will find a solution, although it is not easy, we are aware of this, but I'm not ready to talk today about what, we, what, what it will be, of course. So there you go. It's 
negotiations, the Western powers are starting to sense that sanctions are not quite the silver bullet that they imagined. They're being pushed towards the kind of sanctions they imposed back in 2014. They didn't work then. Some of the talk about uh, sanctions is starting to cause concern around the world and is leading to pushback from many countries, as was evident in that debate in the Security Council. The Americans are already making concessions that they would not have made and were refusing to make just a few months ago on intermediate nuclear forces, on exercises, on transparency, on inspection of their facilities. And we see that there is now two parallel negotiation tracks underway. One between uh, the Americans and the Russians with Bill Blinken due to meet Lavrov again shortly. And another led by Macron, which I've discussed in my two previous videos, a French initiative with Macron due to fly to Moscow and to meet Putin there. So in spite of all the talk of deadlock, in spite of all the talk of war, negotiations are indeed underway. And the reality is that ever so slowly, ever so gently, the United States and NATO are giving ground. Well, thank you for joining me again today. I look forward to you joining me again soon. Future programmes both on this channel and on our main channel, The Duran, where I do programmes with my colleague and friend, Alex Christoforo. Please also remember to check us out on Locals, where we are, uh, uh, where we are publishing lots of exclusive content and where I do live streams every Wednesday at 1400 hours Eastern Standard Time. You can find us also on many other platforms, BitChute Library, Rumble, Odyssey, SuperU, and the rest. And also remember to check out our TV channel, Duran TV. You'll find links under this video. You can support us also via Patreon and Subscribestar. Links under this video also. And by going to our shop and buying the amazing things that you will find there, our magic mugs, our hats, our hoodies, our sweatshirts, our t-shirts, and all the rest. And please also remember, if you've liked this video, to tick the like button to this video and to check your subscription to this channel. Thank you for joining me again today. I look forward to you joining me again soon uh, as this situation continues to evolve and develop. And thank you for joining me again today and have a very good day until then.